back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and these are the best Commander cards from the year that was 2022. And of course, it was a pretty incredible year for Commander. Depending on how you look at it, we certainly got a lot of content. This was a tough one for me because, you know, I started going through all my year-end lists, and I'm just going through all the sets, picking out all the cards that I think are really good in the Commander format, and... Man, there was a lot. You know, I had like 50 cards and then I had to start whittling it down and whittling it down some more. I thought I would do like a top 40 and I'm like, oh, that's just too much. So I whittled it down to 30. So these are the 30 best commander cards of the year. Of course, I'm not talking about commanders. I already covered that in a video. And I also did my video of the 20 cards I missed. So I guess if you look at those 20 cards on top of these 30, now we have 50 cards we're talking about that are maybe commander staples in the format now all fantastic cards there's a lot to talk about here so of course i'm gonna have to get right into it and hopefully i won't dwell too much on each individual card i tend to blather on at times so i'll sort of try to keep it short so let's get to the list relic of legends three mana artifact tap to add a mana of any color tap an untapped legendary creature you control add one mana of any color when this first came out in dominaria united i wasn't super thrilled by it it is a three mana mana rock which you know in the format is now considered a little not so good I, I think there still are a few three mana mana rocks that are good enough to play in the format and this is certainly one of them in a lot of decks where your commander right if we just stay away from the legendary creature tribal which of this is extra good just your commander if you're not tapping it to use an ability and if you're not attacking with it or blocking with it you know you don't plan on really doing anything else with it and there's a lot of commanders that are just sitting there you're using their static abilities or the triggered abilities this just turns your commander into a mana dork so it's just a mana rock that taps for two mana of any color pretty fantastic in the format i think Coming in at number 29, Bitter Reunion. One in a red enchantment. When Bitter Reunion enters the battlefield, you may discard a card. If you do, draw two cards. Pay one. Sacrifice Bitter Reunion. Creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. I just think this is a fantastic card in the commander format. Uh, Thrill of Possibility is in over 100,000 decks on EDH Rec, I think. And this does essentially that. I mean, I guess Thrill of Possibility, you would play in a Spell Slinger theme because it's an instant. But other than that, this is better in every single other scenario because you can also use it to give your team haste. So not only is it good for looting, but it's also good for... I want to give my team haste so it goes in all those decks as well and there's a lot of decks that want to be giving your team haste it just sits there and at the time you want to use it sack it and i run over my opponents with my whole team i definitely think it's a card that's going to see a lot more play in a whole bunch of decks coming in at 28 disciple of callousnin four and a white human wizard three four when disciple of callousnin enters the battlefield starting with you each player chooses up to five permanents they control all permanents other than disciple of callousnin that weren't chosen this way phase out permanents can't phase in so th this is on the opposite end of the spectrum where it's not a card you're going to be throwing in every deck but it is just so unique i have to give it a mention it is a very formidable card in the commander format and it's doing something that we've never seen before permanents can't phase in that part alone is a very significant and i just love cards like this especially when it's stapled on a creature so you can use it over and over again it is just such a very unique and interesting card and it you know again it's very niche but at the same time it is very powerful and unique and it was what it's doing and i think it can be fantastic in a lot of different decks so i just had to give it a mention coming in at 27 hulking metamorph nine mana artifact creature shapeshifter seven seven but has this ability prototype, which means you can cast it for this alternate casting cost of two blue and a blue, which of course means it is a blue card in the commander format, and it will be a 3-3 when it enters the battlefield. This is the mechanic that we saw in Brothers War. You may have Hulking Metamorph enter the battlefield as a copy of an artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact creature in addition to its other types, and its power and toughness are equal to the Hulking Metamorph's power and toughness. I just think this is a very unique card, and a lot of people might have overlooked this one. What I think is particularly good about it, and I think this might be one of the best clone effects we have in the format now, particularly because, it first of all, it copies an artifact or creature. So a Phyrexian Metamorph, again, which is a very popular card in the format i think this is probably better than because you are turning that artifact into a creature or that creature into an artifact i like that about it so you're not just cloning something but it also gives you the ability 
of turning an artifact into a creature. So it, you add that on to what it's already doing. And you also have the added bonus of what if I want to turn a creature into a 7-7 seven, seven, or a 3-3? Three, three, either one is good, right? So if I have a 1-1 one, one creature, now it's going to be a 3-3 three, three, or now it's going to be a 7-7. Seven, seven. So there's a, actually quite a bit going on here. This really is one of the best clones in the format now, I think. Coming in at 26, Root Path Purifier. Three and a green elf druid, three, four. Lands you control and lands cards in your library are basic. And I, I made a video about this card when it first got spoiled. It is an incredibly significant card just in the history of the game in general. What it's doing, again, is very unique. A, a lot like Disciple of Kallus Nin, it is a card that is niche. You're not going to play it in every deck. It is very specific with what it's doing, but it is an incredibly unique ability that we've never seen before, and there are a lot of really interesting busted ways to use this card. It has to get a mention because it is just such a powerful effect and such a unique thing that we've never seen in the game of Magic before. So I had to put it on this list. Coming in at 25, the phasing of Zalfir 2, blue, blue. Enchantment Saga has Read Ahead, which is a mechanic that we saw from Dominar United, which makes Sagas so much better. You can choose to read ahead. So in other words, you don't have to start on the first chapter. You can go to the second chapter or the third. You can skip ahead, which for this card in particular is very, very important. So first of all, chapters one and two, another target non-land permanent phases out. It can't phase in for as long as you control the phasing of Zalfir. So first of all, you can use that ability for a couple of different things. You can phase out your own stuff or you can phase out your opponent's stuff. So if your opponent just has a really troublesome thing on the board, like maybe a winter orb or something, Thing, you can phase it out for a couple of turns. It can be a really nice temporary fix for you. But also chapter three, destroy all creatures. For each creature destroyed this way, its controller creates a 2-2 black Phyrexian creature token. So this is very significant in a couple of ways. First of all, I think it's just a great magic card all around, great in a commander game. There's a lot of versatile ways you can use it. Again, you can do the phasing thing. I can phase out my own creature so that when I board wipe, my creature doesn't get destroyed. Obviously, that I think is probably the way that this is intended to be used. But more importantly, it's just a mono blue board wipe, right? This is four mana, destroy all creatures. Again, you can read ahead. You don't have to do those other two things. If you need to board wipe right now, I can just pay four mana, go straight to chapter three, and destroy all creatures. Now, people are going to get a 2-2 Phyrexian creature token, so if your opponent's playing, you know, some sort of go-wide token theme, you're probably not going to hurt them a whole lot with this. It's not the greatest board wipe ever, but the fact that it's mono blue, and there's a couple cards on this list that the color matters, right? Because in Commander, color really matters. So if we're seeing a an effect in a certain color that we've never seen before, in my opinion, those cards have to make this list because it's a new thing for that color to do, which in the commander format is very significant. Coming in at 24, Gerard's Hourglass Pendant, one mana legendary artifact, has flash. If a player would begin an extra turn, that player skips that turn instead. That might be something that people overlook on this card a little bit. I mean, this is a card that you could put in any deck if you're not doing extra turns, right? And I don't do extra turns in any of my decks. A lot of people don't. So it's just a way to hate on extra turns. And because it has flash, someone's casting that time stretch. Just one mana flash this out. And they just paid, what, 10 mana for absolutely nothing. Pretty fantastic. But the most important part of this card, I think, is four and tap exile droids hourglass pendant. Return to the battlefield tapped all artifact, creature, enchantment, and land cards in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. So this card works really, really well in a lot of decks where you're doing that eggs sort of second sunrise strategy already I have a deck myself interestingly enough my Gerard deck that is doing that so of course it's a fantastic fit there but again getting into the color thing this is board wipe protection for any color because it's a colorless card so if you're in any deck or any color that doesn't really have board wipe protection like green and white do that pretty well but a lot of other colors struggle with that like mono black maybe mono red this is a fantastic way to just protect your board and it protects pretty much everything so if you're in any color where you're just looking for some board wipe protection because you're always getting blown out by those board wipes this is a great way around that i think this card could fit this literally could fit in any deck and it's de definitely going to do work for you but in particular colors i think it's extra good coming in at 23 toxicrine three and a green tyranid two four reach death touch all lands have tap 
add one of mana of any color and lose all other abilities. So again, this falls into that category of it's sort of a niche card, but it's doing something very unique and something very powerful. Again, the, the, all, all the cards on this list, I would say, fall into the categories of either it's like this, where it's doing this very significant thing in a commander game that we've never seen before, or it's one of those cards that you could probably put in any commander deck and it'll be good. This is definitely the former. It is, I think, a maybe almost an auto include in a five color deck. Now, of course, you're going to allow your opponent's lands to tap for mana of any color, but that's probably not going to help them that much. Usually, you, you know, your opponents are probably going to be okay for mana. In a five color deck, it just makes sure all your lands tap for any mana, so you're not going to be hurting at all. Even in like a four or three color deck, that can be really good. But also, the other really significant part here is they lose all other abilities. So it's also a great land hate card and if you're not hurting yourself with this there's no reason not to play it right this is one of those cards that i think you wouldn't realize how significant it is until you actually put it in your deck it's going to shut off some of the most powerful lands in the entire format because all they're going to do is tap for mana of any color so it, just a very very powerful effect and a very significant card in the format i think Coming in at 22, Roboran Mercenaries, three and a white human mercenary, three, four with Vigilance. Roboran Mercenaries has all activated abilities of all legendary creatures you control. Again, this is a card, it's not in very many decks. I think it flew under the radar for a lot of people, but it is a very significant card that is doing something that we've never seen before. So I have to give it a mention. And in the commander format, this can be incredibly important. If you have a commander, and, and again, this is legendary creatures, so I guess it would probably be good in legendary tribal as well, but just your commander, if your commander is white and has an activated ability that maybe you want to be copying, Robrand Mercenaries will do that, right? Your Robrand Mercenaries will have that exact same ability because maybe you want to use it more than once. This is not a card that's going to go in a million different decks. It certainly is not going to be a super popular card in the format. You might not see it that much, but it is very significant to have this sort of effect. And, and I like cards like this because now if I'm in maybe an underwhelming commander deck where you know I don't have a lot of options for making my commander better, if that commander is a white commander that has an activated ability, I just got a great addition for my deck. So that's why I like to see cards like this in the format, and I think it needs to get a mention on this list. Coming in at 21 is Silverback Elder. Two green, 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 ape, shaman, five, seven. Whenever you cast a creature spell, choose one. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. That's pretty good. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield. Tapped. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in random order, or you gain four life. So three fantastic things that you're always going to be wanting to do all the time in a commander game worst case scenario you can just gain four life this just goes in pretty much every deck right this falls into the category of you can just put it in any deck and it's always going to be good i guess unless you don't have creatures but if you're in a green deck i don't think that's ever going to happen i put this a little lower on the like i could have very easily put this in the top 10 for sure it does have the three green which means it is going to very much limit the amount of decks you put this in i don't think i would put this in a five or four color deck even in a three color deck it might be a little tough definitely any mono green deck this is going to be phenomenal and it probably a two color deck as well there really is no reason not to put this in a a mono colored green deck or a two color green deck as long as you have a reasonable amount of creatures because you're always going to be wanting to do all of these things especially destroying the artifacts and enchantments that's something you're going to be wanting to do all the time in a commander game just a fantastic commander staple going forward no question getting into the top 20 black market connections two and a black enchantment at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase choose one or more Create a treasure token, you lose one life. Draw a card, you lose two life. Create a 3-2 colorless shapeshifter creature token with changeling, you lose three life. So... Of course, this is a commander staple for sure. It's already in 44,000 decks. I can't believe it. Um, obviously, a lot of people love this card, and I've been seeing it quite a bit. I like it less than most people, which is why I only have it at number 20. A lot of people are probably going to put this way higher on their list. So I'm not going to talk about the upsides of this card. I'm going to talk about why I have it a lot lower than most people would. It's obviously a great card that you could put in a lot of decks. I think people are shoehorning this into way too many decks. Just creating a treasure token in your pre combat main phase and losing a life is okay it i mean it's sort of temporary ramp not great drawing a card and losing two life is not a great rate because most of those like Frixie and arena type of effects are going to draw you a card and you only lose one life now of course you can do them both i think a lot of people are going to both create the treasure token and draw a card and you're going to end up losing three life this is one of those cards that i think can really suck your life total without you knowing I, you know i talk about cards like ancient tomb being one of those cards it's one of those greed cards where people like to play it and then they're being a little greedy with it so it ends up hurting their life to a lot more than they 
w- would like to. And I, what I say all the time about cards like that, Mana Crypt is another one that it's a really powerful card, but I think you would be surprised how much it sucks away at your life total. Keep track of it. I would say the same thing with Black Market Connections. When you put this card in your deck, this is the only warning I'm going to give, when it hits the table, okay, actually keep track of the amount of life you're paying for it because I think you would be surprised. You know, by the end of the game, when you lose, you look and you're like, oh man, I put 21 life or something into my Black Market Connections, you know, at the, over the course of the game. It's one of those cards, again, just like a Mana Crypt or an Ancient Tomb where early in the game, it can be really great giving you all that value, but at the same time, the earlier you play it in the game, the more of your life total it's going to suck away. And then later in the game, it's not nearly as good. So it sort of falls into that category for me. Certainly a a great card because, of course, those other two cards are great in the format as well. Just got to be careful with that whole life total thing, right? Coming in at number 19, again, another one of those cards that falls into the category of you could just put it in any commander deck. Baylor, three red, red, demon, five, five with flying. Whenever Baylor attacks or dies, choose one or more. Each mode must target a different player. So target opponent draws three cards, then discards three cards at random. So that might not seem particularly great where you're letting your opponent draw, but man, discarding cards at random is so brutal. It is very likely that your opponent is going to discard something that they don't want to discard. Also works particularly well in those wheel decks where you want your opponents to be drawing and discarding. Target opponent sacrifices a non-token artifact. That's great. Can't sacrifice a treasure here. It's got to be non-token. Baylor deals damage to target opponent equal to the number of cards in their hand. So those are three things that you're going to be wanting to do every single turn. Again, this fits into any deck. Fits particularly well in certain themes, obviously. You know, you can just look at your opponents and go, okay, my one opponent has a non-token artifact that I want them to sacrifice. They have like an Acroma's Memorial or something. It's their only non-token artifact. So if I attack them, I can force them to sacrifice it. The other two modes I don't really care about, right? I'll just target the other opponents. That, you know, it doesn't matter who I attack with. It's just that one thing that I want to be doing. So there can be a lot of situations where you want to be doing all three of these things, but maybe you just want to do one and the other ones you just target random opponents. You don't really care who gets what. It's always going to be good for you. Fantastic card in a commander game, no question. Coming in at number 18, Saw in Half. That's right, we have an Infinity card on this list, and I don't think a lot of people would dispute that this is a great card in a lot of commander decks. Two and a black instant, destroy target creature. If that creature dies this way, its controller creates two tokens that are copies of that creature, except their base power is half that creature's power, and their base toughness is half that creature's toughness round up each time. So a lot of buzz about this card ever since it first got spoiled like a year ago I think it, it, it's been now it first of all is a fantastic sort of clone copy effect in mono black which we don't really have at all so that that in itself makes it unique it is a great card that way typically you don't care about having the power and toughness you just want a copy of an ATB effect everyone pointed out Grey Merchant of Asphodel which is probably one of the best targets for this because it's going to see the pips on the copies, right? They see each other. So you're going to get that effect even greater when you make the token copies of it. It's going to fit in a lot of decks. A lot of decks, it's going to be really great. It can be a response to removal even, right? I have a creature in play and my opponent's about to kill it. You know, as long as it's not a legendary creature. I mean, I guess even if it is a legendary creature, you can saw in half your own creature and then you get the two token copies. Of course, you'll legend rule yourself, but you still get to keep one. So you essentially still get a token copy of your commander in play, which is probably just as good as the original, right? So it even can be used there. I will point out, as I did in my, you know, wrong card with the wrong commander video that I did a little while back, you have to be careful here. Destroy target creature if that creature dies this way. So if that creature isn't actually dying, so if there is a ley line of the void type of effect in play, that creature won't be dying. If that creature is indestructible, it won't be dying. The creature has to die in order for you to get the token copies. So you do have to be careful there. Great card in a commander game, no question. Coming in at number 17, Takassi's Welcome. Two and a white enchantment. Whenever one or more creatures with mana value three or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. This is probably one of the best white card draw effects we have now. I have more on this list because, of course, we're always giving white more and more awesome. Like, like honestly, guys, can, are we at the point now where I think white is certainly is not the worst color in the format at drawing cards anymore. I mean, it is specific in what it's doing. Yes, you have to have a creature 
with mana value three or less entering the how many white decks are doing that like 50 percent of them right there's so many this is a phenomenal card draw effect it is better than welcoming vampire welcoming vampire is one of those cards that everyone freaked out about when it came out last year i think cassie's welcome is better first of all it's an enchantment so it's a lot less likely that your opponents are going to destroy it you know or even just it gets caught up in a board wipe right people are board wiping all the time so even if they're not specifically going after that creature it's going to get killed in the board wipe because board wipes are killing all creatures typically right your Takasi's welcome is not going to get hit by that of course it triggers only once each turn but that means you can have creatures enter the battlefield on other people's turns as well which can be really goodly really good in a lot of decks it is i think one of the best white card draw engines in the format now and fits in so many decks fantastic card coming in at number 16 again talking about cards that fit in any deck this is one of them shadow in the warp one red and a green enchantment the first creature spell you cast each turn cost two less to cast that's something you want to do in every again if you're in a grill deck that's probably certainly something you're going to be doing a lot but worst case scenario i just get to cast my commander for two less which pretty much every deck wants to do right if your commander has a two generic mana in its mana cost or more this just makes your commander cost two less so it seems like a great fit there and then of course if you're playing lots of creatures very creature heavy deck which a lot of gruel decks are gets even better from there right but then on top of that whenever an opponent casts their first non-creature spell each turn shadow in the warp deals two damage to that player so again something you're always going to want to be doing why wouldn't you want to do that right all your opponents are going to be casting non-creature spells so why not hit them for two damage and then again it only gets better from there where you have the guy with the spell slinger theme who's going to be casting spells on everyone else's turn counter spells all that kind of stuff they're going to be taking two damage from it because it's probably the first spell they cast on that turn right so it, it can be extra good against certain other decks as well you can just throw this in any gruel deck there's very little reason not to Coming in at number 15, Tomb Fortress, a land on this list. I got a couple lands on this list, in fact. And again, this falls into the category of if you have a black deck, there's really not a whole lot of reason not to put it in there. Tomb Fortress enters the battlefield tapped and taps to add a black. Pay two black, 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 and tap. Exile Tomb Fortress. Mill four cards, then return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Activate only as a sorcery. So it is a land that is recurring creatures from graveyards. Pretty fantastic. There's not really much to say here other than if you have a black deck, you're almost assuredly going to have creatures in it. Probably at the very least your commander. So... Why not throw this in there? I can't think of too many reasons not to. Coming in at number 14, Sardinian Avenger. One in a red, Goblin Warrior 1-1. One, one, has First Strike and Trample. Not great for a 1-1 one, one creature. However, whenever Sardinian Avenger attacks, it gets plus X, plus O until end of turn, where X is the number of artifacts your opponents control. And of course, the First Strike and the Trample very much play into the plus X, plus O. I mean, this might as well be plus X, plus X, because you're creature has first strike which means it's not really going to care how much its toughness is i guess unless the other creature it's being blocked by also has first strike and of course the trample cares very much about power and doesn't care about the toughness so that's pretty fantastic whenever an artifact an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield certainly avenger deals one damage to that player so this card is doing two really fantastic things in a commander game and th this card's even better than i originally thought because when i looked at it i was like okay well, there's lots of treasure token themes out there artifact token themes in general this guy's going to be great against all of them you're sacrificing those treasure tokens or those artifact tokens and when do they go to the graveyard you're going to deal one damage to that player that's great and of course your opponent's got lots of treasure tokens around when you attack you get plus x plus o however the wording here is whenever it attacks it gets plus x plus o until end of turn where x is the number of artifacts your opponents control all of your opponents so that means yeah you can attack the guy with the treasure token theme but your other opponent's got a couple mana rocks lying around it's going to be plus x plus o for those as well i haven't yet to use this guy in a game i grabbed a copy myself for my mono red deck just because again you can throw this card in any commander deck and it's going to do a ton of work for you because people are always having artifacts go to the graveyard and people are always playing artifacts so it's just going to be a big beater in pretty much any deck so i have yet to see this actually in action but i imagine you could be attacking with this and it is very easily like going to be like a 10-1 first strike trample that seems pretty good for two mana coming in at lucky number 13 vexilus praetor three and a white custodes warrior three four with flash and vigilance commanders you control have protection from everything 
That seems pretty good. <laughs> Again, this is one of those cards that you could put it in any deck. There are a few stipulations here, and, and you know, I will get into pr the protection thing a little bit because people get a little confused about it. I mean, I, I suppose you wouldn't put this in a Progenitus deck because there would be no reason to. But other than that, any deck that is white, you could put this in there to protect your commander. It is going to protect against damage, first of all, which is great. So anyone throwing damage around with like a Blasphemous Act or something, your commander will be fine. Any targeting your commander can't be targeted with targeted removal, can't throw a Song of the Dryads on there and anything like that. So it's going to protect against all of that stuff. Another significant part here that people might not be aware of is your commander can't be blocked, which is really, really good in any deck where you want to be attacking with your commander or you want to be getting your commander in for damage. And there's a lot of decks like that, right? Your commander can't be blocked by anything that it has protection from and it has protection from everything. So it makes your commander unblockable as well, which is really 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 good of course the fact that it says flash means you can flash it in and make your opponent waste their removal spell i don't know how much this is going to see play honestly the downside here and i guess i should talk about that a little is you can't target your commander with anything right so that is where this won't work this is no good in a voltron strategy i know people think oh this is great in a voltron strategy no all of your auras will fall off all of your equipment will fall off you can't even equip your commander right colorless doesn't work colorless is included in everything everything means everything so this is actually terrible in a Voltron strategy. It is way, way better in a strategy where, yes, I have that commander that I want to be getting in for damage with, but I don't necessarily want to load it up with a bunch of aura and equipments. But in general, just I don't want my commander to get touched. It's fantastic there. So it, it really can fit in a lot of decks. Not every deck, but definitely fits in a ton for sure. One of the best ways to protect your commander in the format. Coming in at number 12, Agent of the Iron Throne. Two and a black legendary enchantment background. Commander creatures you own have. Whenever an artifact or creature you control is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent loses one life. You know, I could, probably could have mentioned a few backgrounds. This is the only background I have on this list. I, I probably could have mentioned a few. The backgrounds you know the, the initial evaluation of those cards is i didn't love it i didn't love that they were shoehorning enchantments into the command zone you know it was sort of like the, that here we will go again moment however what i realized about the backgrounds very quickly is a lot of them are really fantastic in the 99 of decks and this is probably the best this one is for sure the background that i have shoehorned into the most amount of decks so far and and probably going forward as well i have put this in a ton of decks for my patrons um, you know, when I'm doing the Deck Doctor videos, I've made this as a suggestion. It is one of the best Blood Artist effects, I guess you can call it, uh, that we have in the format now. Again, it's an enchantment. So any of those, you know, Blood Art Zulaport Cutthroat effects get removed by the board wipes, whereas this will stick around. So it's a lot harder to get off the table. Also works with artifacts as well. So if you're any in any of those treasure token themes, which there are a lot of those in black, this is just an auto include because every time you sacrifice a treasure token, that is a artifact going from graveyard to the battlefield and you're going to drain your opponents. It's just one of the best life drain blood artist type of effects that we have in the format now. And it goes in so many decks. I see it's in 13,000 already. It probably could go in a whole lot more. Really, really fantastic card in the 99. Coming in at number 11, Defiler of Vigor. Three green, green, Frixian Worm, 6-6 six, six, with Trample. And I would just like to point out, you know, on the whole power creep side of things, this is a five mana 6-6 six, six Trample creature. Boy, how things have changed. I think back to the Root Breaker Worm. That was one of my favorite creatures when I first started playing the game. Seven mana, just saying. Anyway, that's not really the reason you want to put this in your deck, even though a 6-6 six, six Trample creature is pretty good. As an additional cost to cast green permanent spells, you may pay two life. Those spells cost a green less to cast if you pay life this way. This effect reduces only the amount of green mana you pay. So, you know, as people would probably notice, this is very familiar to Phyrexian mana. They're sort of making your green permanent spells have Phyrexian mana, essentially. Now, you can only use one per spell. That is important to note. You know, as has been pointed out, and I, I talked about this in, in my Cards I Got Wrong video where I had Defiler of Dreams higher on my list from Dominaria because it was drawing cards, but you're not typically casting a lot of blue permanent spells in your blue decks, whereas with green decks, you're doing it a lot more typically your creatures, right? All your creatures, you can use this on. That's pretty darn good, right? But more importantly, the last ability is what makes this card really a commander staple now going forward. Whenever you cast a green permanent spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. It's a win con. I mean, let's be honest. This is a really nice 
win con in a lot of green decks, especially those decks that are casting a lot of creatures. Those elf ball decks just got a lot better with this guy because, of course, a lot of those elves cost one mana, so I can just pay the two life rather than pay the green mana for it. And when I cast that green permanent spell, now I get to put a counter on each of my creatures so I can very easily do three, four, five creatures in a turn and load up my team with plus one, plus one counters. Obviously fits really well in all those plus one, plus one counter themes as well, which, of course, there's a ton of those in green. It is absolutely a commander staple. It's, it's going to be used a lot going forward in the commander format for sure. Great card. Getting into the top 10, Deep Gnome Terramancer. One and a white Gnome Wizard 2-2 with Flash. Whenever one or more lands enter the battlefield under opponent's control without being played, you may search your library for a Plains card, put it onto the battlefield, tap, then shuffle. Do this only once each turn. This, to me, is the best white ramp card now in the format. I think it's fantastic. It's only two mana, so you can get it out early, which is what you want, right? Because ramping it early in the game is really the most important part, right? The fact that it has Flash pretty much guarantees that you're at least going to get a one shot off of this. And, and, you know, I really went off on this card when it came out in Baldur's Gate. I couldn't believe it. And I'm actually surprised this card isn't more popular in the format because I think it's absurdly busted. For me, I look at this card and I think the worst case scenario is my opponent cracks their fetch land and they're about to get another land into play that wasn't played. And I guess I should clarify there. A played land is I play my one land per turn. That's what a played land is. And of course, if I have an exploration effect, I can now play more than one land per turn. That would be included there. But everything else, like all the ramp, the fetch lands, all of that is not a land that is being played. It's entering the battlefield without being played. So that covers a whole lot of stuff, right? So worst case scenario here, my opponent cracks their fetch lands, just their evolving wilds, which a lot of people play in the format. I respond by flashing this guy in. They get their land into play that triggers my deep gnome terramancer, assuming someone doesn't instantly kill it before I get the trigger, which is entirely unlikely. Now I get to go get a Plains card. And again, it's not a basic land. It's a Plains card. So I can go get a Triome with this. If I'm in a three color deck, that's why I think this card is absurdly good. You don't just play it in a mono white deck. You can play this in a three or even a five color deck to go get your Triomes and put them into play. Now I'm fixed in three colors. If I get nothing else from this card, what I just got was two mana, instant speed, get a Triome out of my library and put it directly into play. And I have a 2-2 body on the table. And my opponents now have to use a removal spell on it or I will get more value off of it. It seems insanely good to me. I've used this card. I have it in my Benny Brax deck. That was the first opportunity I had to use it. Got two lands off of it and that was it. Two mana get two lands. Seems pretty good, right? So I, I don't know. I, I, I'm actually shocked this isn't more popular. I thought this everyone is going to be shoehorning this into all their decks. Again, if I'm even, even in a white-green deck, I think this card is worth playing. It doesn't care about the amount of lands you have. You can ramp to your heart's content in your white-green deck, have 30 lands in play, and this guy will still get you lands. That's ridiculous, right? Like, what other card does that? It's so good. And again, staple on a creature which means I can get it back out of the graveyard maybe or something, right? This seems like a fantastic card that just goes in almost any deck. Surprise, not more popular. Coming in at number nine, Ruthless Technomancer. Three and a black human wizard, two, four. When Ruthless Technomancer enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature you control. If you do, create a number of treasure tokens equal to that creature's power. Again, we're in the situation where I already have, with just that ability, a really great ability that wants to be going in a ton of decks, particularly those sacrifice themes, right? But also, two and a black sacrifice X artifacts return target creature card with power X or less. From your graveyard to the battlefield, X can't be zero. This has been out for almost a year now already, so people are already starting to discover all the different interesting ways you can use it and all the decks that it fits into. This is probably second place behind Agent of the Iron Throne with the amount of decks that I have shoehorned it into because it fits in so many different decks. It goes in the Sacrifice theme. It goes in the I Want to Create Treasure Tokens theme. It goes in the Sacrifice Artifact theme as well. If you're in a Treasure Token theme in black, you definitely want to be playing it. You can get into some shenanigans here because, of course, you're sacrificing a creature and getting a number of Treasure Tokens equal to its power. So when that creature goes to the graveyard, if its power is now only one, for example, because it had counters on it or some other reason, now now you can get it back a lot easier without having to sacrifice all those treasure tokens. So you can get into some shenanigans there. Just a really great card that fits in so many different commander decks. Again, it is kind of niche, but at the same time, I think you could probably put this in any commander deck and it'll still do a lot of work for you. 
Coming in at number eight, a card that I'm going to have way higher on this list than a lot of other people, but I, I think it is a commander staple and it should see a lot more play. I'm going to have to talk about this in one of my five cards videos because I can't believe that this card isn't more popular. Campfire, one mana artifact, pay one and tap, you gain two life. Pay two and tap, exile campfire, put all commanders you own from the command zone and from your graveyard into your hand, then shuffle your graveyard into your library. So the big, big thing for me with this card is it gets your commander out of the command zone into your hand, which again, cards like this are really, really important in the format. You look at cards like Phage the Untouchable or Hack on Stromgold Scourge or My Name is One deck. There's lots of these commanders that you really, really badly need in your hand because you have to cast them from your hand. So it is important for that reason. Having a colorless option other than Command Beacon to do that is really, really important. There's also a lot of decks out there that just want their commander really bad. I mean, if you want your commander really badly and you need it for your deck, which most commander decks do, and you imagine your, your opponents are going to try to be getting off the table, which a lot of people will be doing, this is a great option. Just, I don't have to cast my commander a million times. I can put it into my hand so that I can just play it again. So it's also important there. However, don't forget guys, this also shuffles your graveyard into your library. And we'll just take a look at another card here, Elixir of Immortality, one mana artifact. Pay two, tap, you gain five life, shuffle Elixir of Immortality and your graveyard into owner's library. This card is in 44,000 decks. It's been played in Commander since forever. When I first started playing the format, I noticed a lot of people had this in their deck and I couldn't figure out why. I think it's in a lot of pre-cons. How is Campfire not better than this? I mean, first of all, you, you st it still has the life gain part, right? So you can sit there and just, you can gain life if that's what you really need to do. Although I don't think a lot of people are playing Elixir of Immortality for the life gain. They're playing it to shuffle their graveyard into their library. Campfire is doing that. And then also putting your commander into your hand from the command zone. So it's doing that and so much more. So how is Campfire not way better than Elixir of, of Immortality? I don't know. Anyone who has Elixir of Immortality in their deck should probably just swap it out for Campfire, I think. Am I wrong on this one? Let me know if I'm missing something here. But Campfire should definitely be in way, way, way more decks. Coming in at number seven, Lauren of the Third Path. And I am breaking with tradition here because I usually never mention legendary creatures or commanders on these lists. I like to keep them separate. I, I already did my best commanders of the year. Now I'm doing my 99 cards. But Lauren of the Third Path is so incredibly significant that I had to give it a mention on this list. So two and a white legendary creature human artificer 2-1 with vigilance when lauren of the third path enters the battlefield destroy up to one target artifact or enchantment and you can also tap it you and target opponent each draw card this just goes in the 99 of so many decks again this fits into that first category of if i'm playing a white deck why not put this in there so if i'm in white I have a better option than a Reclamation Sage because it's a creature that's ETBing to destroy an artifact or enchantment. Fits in all those blink strategies, copy strat, all of that, right? Recursion strategies, all of that. And then on top of it, I have a 2-1 creature with Vigilance, which is better than a 2-1 creature with nothing. And then also I can use it for the last ability, you and target opponent each draw a card, which now it's a card draw option as well. It's also a politics option. This can make a very interesting, fun commander for sure, but... It is just a phenomenal card in the 99. I'm thinking, you know, of all the white decks I have, and I have quite a few, why, wouldn't I want to put this in all of them? Probably, right? Because it is just a, a great removal option, stapled on a creature, and then also has that card draw thing, right? So I'm breaking with tradition here by mentioning a commander in my best cards of the year because this just goes in the 99 of so many decks. Coming in at number six, and of course... Being me, you're going to see a lot of removal towards the top of this list because removal wins games. It's very important in the format. And again, getting into the color specific thing, this one is very, very significant. Wild Magic Surge, red and a red instant, destroy target permanent and opponent controls. Its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a permanent card that shares a type with that permanent. They put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of their library in random order. So this is just a card that if I'm in a mono red deck, I got to put it in there. It's like Chaos Warp, right? If you have Chaos Warp, you probably also want this card as well. It, I mean, obviously it's a little bit different. Chaos Warp isn't guaranteeing your opponent anything. Wild Magic Surge kind of does guarantee your opponent something. So it does make it a little bit worse. It is only two mana, but it's just another option, right? Destroy any permanent. That is incredible. I, I say all the time, if I'm putting removal in my deck, the stuff I'm going to go after first is the stuff that's going to hit any permanent because I never know what my opponent is going to be doing. 
Maybe it's a land that's screwing me. Maybe it's an enchantment. Maybe it's an artifact that's helping them win the game. This can hit anything. And I don't really care what they're going to flip off the top because I'm getting that thing off the table that is winning them the game, right? Or ruining the game for me. Again, though, the color-specific part is very important here. This is a red card, and red can't deal with enchantments. This is a way to deal with enchantments. That's why this card is incredibly significant. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you look at the absurd amount of cards we got this year for Commander and all the great ones we have, the ones on this list, you might think it's wacky that I put this so high on the list, but going forward, just like with Chaos Warp, right? How much did people tout Chaos Warp when it first came out? Hopefully a lot, because, of course, it's been a Commander staple ever since it first came out, and this will be the same. In 10 years, hopefully people will still be playing Commander, they will be playing this card still. It's gonna be getting used until the end of time in Commander decks because of what it's doing, without question. Coming into the top five, we got Archivist of Ogma, one and a white, Halfling Cleric 2-2 two -two with Flash. Whenever an opponent searches their library, you gain one life and draw a card. So of course, another card that I sort of lost my mind on when it first came out, and did I overreact? No, I don't think I did. I think this card is phenomenal and I think it could go in any deck. Your opponents are always searching their libraries, always. Not only does it draw you a card, it gains you a life. This is the best white card draw card we have now, in my opinion. Even if I only draw one card off of this, it's pretty good. And because I can flash it in, I'm guaranteed to get a card draw off of this. This is two mana, I flash this in when my opponent's about to cast their Rampant Growth or whatever. They're searching their library, this card triggers, I gain a life and I get the draw card, and then I have a 2-2 body on the table, which, again, my opponent has to waste a removal spell on if they don't want me drawing any more cards. I think this is the best white card draw card we have in the format. I went back and forth between this and Deep Gnome Terramancer when I did my Baldur's Gate review, and I ended up putting Deep Gnome Terramancer at number one because I thought it was just slightly better than Archivist of Ogma and went in more decks, and I flip-flop now where I think Archivist of Ogma is probably the one that's going to go in more decks because it can literally go in any deck. And then on top of that, we have the, you know, what if I want to gain life? So again, my Patron of the Kitsune deck, this is a phenomenal fit because not only am I drawing cards, I also am getting those life gain triggers as well. So it's a extra good fit. You know, it's already a good fit in any white deck, but an extra good fit in any white deck that is, is wanting life gain triggers as well. Again, commander staple moving forward forever. No question. Coming in at number four, Plaza of Heroes. Another card that as soon as I saw it, I immediately had to make a video about it because I thought it was incredibly significant. And this one maybe more so because it is a colorless land, which means it can go in any deck and as we all know it's very easy to shoehorn a land a utility land into your commander decks because you're already going to have a bunch of lands as well so you just take one land out and replace it with this so taps to add a colorless all right now that's not great however i will point out this doesn't enter the battlefield tapped like a lot of those other lands those utility lands do this just comes into play right away and you can use it right away tap add one mana of any color spend this mana only to cast a legendary spell so worst case scenario again i can just use this to cast my commander i now have a land that taps for colorless mana and i can tap it to add one of mana of any color for whenever I cast my commander. That's pretty good. Tap, add one mana of any color among legendary permanents you control. So now I'm starting to add more colors, right? So if I get my commander out, now likely, not guaranteed, but likely this will be tapping to add mana of any color. So now it's getting even better. But I think the most significant part is the last ability, and this is why I'm gonna shoehorn it into as many decks as I can. Pay three mana and tap Exile Plaza of Heroes, target legendary creature, gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. When are you ever not gonna wanna do that in your deck? I guess if you don't have a legendary creature as a commander, so maybe you have a Planeswalker as a commander, maybe if you just don't care about your commander at all, not a lot of decks doing that. So 90% of decks are gonna want this in there just for that one instance of, I can protect my commander. Now, I know a lot of people said that the pushback I got is, oh, I gotta leave this untapped and I gotta leave three mana untapped in order to use this, that's a whole lot to protect. Yeah, but it's stapled on a land. You don't have to do any of that. It just sits there tapping for mana. And then at some point later in the game, hey, someone's casting a board wipe. I just happen to have the mana open. Now I can save my commander. That can be very significant later in a game. And again, later in a the game, there's gonna be more chance that my commander gets removed and less chance that I'm gonna need the mana that I have in play. So it's gonna be very easy for me to do so. If I have one of those commanders that is gonna be a target all the time, then maybe I do wanna leave the mana open. It's giving hexproof and indestructible, which protects from almost every single card except the card that I have higher up on this list, interestingly enough. I like 
like protecting my stuff. I think it is surprisingly underrated. If you think about cards like Teferi's Protection, pe people have even called for that card to get banned because the ridiculous amount of advantage it gives to you, it, the one-sided board wipe essentially that occurs when your opponent casts a board wipe and you Teferi's Protection, everyone loses their stuff and you get to keep yours. Cards like that are just absolute blow at some time. Now, this is only going to protect one thing. It only protects legendary creatures, but of course... That's going to be something you're probably always going to be wanting to do. More significantly, it is the situation where it is so easy for me to put this in my deck. Why wouldn't I do that? Coming in at number three, again, another card that I sort of went bananas about when it first came out. And another card that people are probably shocked I have it so high on this list. But again, another staple in the commander format without a doubt going forward for a long, long time. An offer you can't refuse. One blue mana instant counter target non-creature spell. Its controller creates two treasure tokens. I couldn't believe how much pushback I got on this card when I first talked about it. People were like, oh, it's not that giving your opponent two treasure tokens is so good. I'm like, really? Counter and expropriate, give my opponent true treasure tokens, that seems pretty good. Or counter my opponent's board wipe, or counter, you know, non-creature covers almost every single thing I want to be countering in the entire format for one blue mana. That seems pretty good. I'm okay with my opponent getting two treasure tokens, right? You know, I'm not the guy who counters a soul ring. Countering your opponent's soul ring and then giving him two treasure tokens, that doesn't seem great. I'm the guy that's going to be countering the five, six, seven, eight mana spell. Now, I'm also the guy who doesn't really counter creatures a lot. I, I'm not going to counter my opponent's commander. I know lots of people do li like to do that. I don't. So non-creature spell is going to cover 99% of the things that I counter in a commander game anyway i'm either going to be countering removal that's targeting my stuff board wipes that you know I, I have a huge advantage and i don't want to see a board wipe right now i'll counter that my opponent's cyclonic rift something everyone hates so much you're going to counter that with this the ether flux reservoir win con that i hate so much i'm going to counter that the only thing this isn't getting off the top of my head that i really don't like is like a crater hoof other than that it's going to get everything else for one mana and i don't care if my opponent's getting true treasure tokens i don't really care i don't think that's that big of a deal this is my favorite counter spell in the format right now and i think it's one of the best counter spells in the format right now i see it's already in 82,000 decks so clearly a lot of people agree with me I, I probably have this way higher on the list than a lot of people but again as you'll see a lot of removal at the top of this list counter spells can kind of be considered removal dealing with what your opponents are doing and again i don't want to go off on a huge diatribe here but you know i just talked about banned cards in the format quite a bit in a couple of videos recently this is how you deal with that stuff guys you, you don't like your opponents playing smothering tide all the time or, or whatever that card is you really don't like one mana solve that problem put more counter spells and removal in your deck to deal with what your opponents are doing if you don't like what you see simple as that for me speaking of which getting to number two farewell for white white sorcery Choose one or more. Exile all artifacts, exile all creatures, exile all enchantments, or exile all graveyards. So, of course, that means you can choose one of these, you can choose two, you can choose three, or you can choose them all. This is the best board wipe in the format now. You know, when it first came out, I was like, okay, I really still like Austere Command. It's still one of my personal favorites. I like that, you know, with Austere Command, and I will give a shout out to it here because I th still think it is very good. I still go back and forth a little bit. Austere Command can be a big advantage to you where I am in a creature theme where I have a lot of really cheap creatures, maybe a token theme, so I can choose the creatures that have the greater mana value and give a big advantage for myself. Or the opposite, I can choose the small creatures and wipe out all my opponent, because they're all playing a token theme, wipe out all their tokens and my commander costs like five mana so I won't hit that. I like the advantage you can give yourself there. Sometimes that can be better than farewell, but pretty much every other scenario farewell is better. Obviously it's exiling. That's a big part. And again, just like I talked about with the heroic intervention and stuff like that, this is getting around that. This just gets around almost all board weight protection. It gets around all protections of any kind. Your opponent's creatures are indestructible. They're gone. Your opponent's creatures can't be targeted. They're gone. Phasing is the only thing that, that is going to protect against this. And then on top of that, you get the graveyard hate as well. And I say all the time, you need to have graveyard hate in any deck. And this is doing that. I, I just think it's the best board wipe in the format now. I, I think I, 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 I got to give it the nod. Best board wipe in the format that we have now. And of course, going forward again, See, it's already in 75,000 decks on EDH Rec. That number is only going to continue to get higher. Coming in at number one for me, though, and again, back to the removal. 
And back to the whole lands can very easily shoehorn in any deck. This is hitting on all cylinders here. Bozeju who endures. I have to give a, I guess, an honorable mention to the other lands in this cycle. They're all great. And again, because they're lands, they can very easily fit into any deck that is in that particular color. But of course, Bozeju who endures is by far the best because it's removal, but also just in general, what it's doing, I think is the best out of all the lands. So it's a legendary land, which, you know, isn't really that significant at all not in the commander format anyway taps to add a green so you're getting the green mana that you need and you can channel one in a green discard bozeju who endures destroy target artifact enchantment or non-basic land that's hitting a lot of really problematic things in the format right like I say all the time, everyone is so concentrating on the creatures and having to deal with them, but you would be surprised how often it is an artifact, an enchantment, or a non-basic land that is costing you the game. That player may search their library for a land card with a basic land type, put it onto the battlefield. This spell costs one less to activate for each legendary creature you control, so it's very likely this is only going to cost one green mana. The really, really significant part about this card, it is the channel ability. And what makes that important is you are discarding it from your hand, so that means you're not casting it so that means it can't be countered this is a fantastic removal spell that essentially can't be countered stifle another card that i like to talk about a lot on my channel because i think it is significant will work here okay so if your opponent plays bozeju all the time and you're looking for a way to get around it stifle will work it'll counter that activated ability because this is an activated ability it's got that little colon there but other than that man this gets around so many things and just instant speed i destroy an artifact enchantment or non-basic land for probably one mana on land it just doesn't get any better than that again if we're talking about a card that you could just literally really put in any deck if my deck is green i see no reason not to put that in there even if i'm in a five color deck i would probably try to find room for this in my five color deck just because it is a fantastic removal option that is essentially uncounterable that is stapled on a land doesn't get much better than that i, I think it is the best card of the year in a year that had a ton of great cards this one's the best for me in the commander format but that is it that is all what did i miss i'm sure there was a bunch like i said i originally had at least 50 cards whittled down to 40 and then i was going to do a top 40 and i'm like oh that's going to take forever i'll whittle it down to 30 so I, I i knocked off a bunch right before i did this video so i only had to do the top 30 they're all fantastic I, again some of these fit into the category of they are pretty niche but very very significant and i had to give them a mention and then a lot of these i would say probably at least 20 of them are just those cards that they're commander staples and we're going to see them in a ton of decks going forward for a long, long time without question. What did I miss? I'm sure I missed some stuff. Let me know in the comments below what is one of your favorite cards from this year that I didn't cover in my, remember I made a 20 cards that I missed this year. So I also covered those and then this video as well. So that's 50 cards. What did I miss other than that? Right, because I've already talked about all the best cards of the year. Let me know in the comments below, but that is it for today and thanks for tuning in.